So hello everyone and uh, welcome uh, to the, the ICFJ Global Health Crisis uh, Reporting uh, uh, Forum. Uh, my name is uh, Paul Adepoju and I'm really glad to have you on today's uh, webinar, uh, which is on a very uh, key issue, which is uh, looking at the connection uh, between uh, obesity uh, and uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, quick background, uh, several weeks ago uh, in March, uh, uh, the World Obesity Day was celebrated and uh, a report was uh, released on this particular day that showed that uh, individuals uh, with obesity at 10, 10 times uh, uh, have a 10 times higher chance of dying from COVID-19 uh, than individuals who are not obese. And uh, these uh, reports actually resonated globally and uh, called attention uh, to the importance of uh, committing more resources, committing more time, uh, being more serious, being more intentional about addressing issues that has to do with uh, uh, overweight and, uh, and obesity. But uh, while obesity and overweight are accepted as a major uh, problem, uh, global response uh, to these uh, to this development to these issues uh, has not been the same across board. Uh, while we have countries that are at the forefront of combating uh, obesity, even at the local level, uh, by intentionally promoting and supporting uh, local entrepreneurs that are producing and marketing uh, LV products, we actually have countries that are uh, that the producers of products that are driving uh, their local, uh, the local obesity uh, epidemic in these countries, where these companies are more influential, more powerful, and are seen as more critical to local economies than their healthy options. And uh, so that is where we are globally. And uh, reporting uh, obesity to an overweight uh, for journalists in different parts of the world uh, could actually be tricky, especially if you don't know the right terminologies uh, to use, if you don't know the, uh, the people to talk to, and what the key issues are. And that is why today uh, we are deciding to put attention, to put the focus on talking about uh, obesity. And uh, we have uh, we have an expert uh, who is vast, not just in obesity, but in uh, non-communicable uh, diseases, and will be helping us to see the connections uh, between uh, these issues and how they affect global health during the pandemic and post-pandemic. So I'm talking about uh, Joanna Rostin, who is the CEO of the World uh, Obesity uh, Federation. How are you doing today, Joanna? Thanks for joining us. Thanks, I'm doing really well, Paul. I'm so happy to be here. Um, it's an honor and a, and a privilege, so thank you. Um, so we are, we are really happy to be having you. And uh, before we go to, into uh, Joanna's uh, presentation, uh, I would like to notify you that if you are joining us on the Facebook uh, live, uh, live stream, uh, please put your questions uh, below in the chat and the chat uh, space available on Facebook. And if you are with us today uh, via Zoom, please use the Q&A uh, chat option uh, to put up your questions. And uh, at the right time, uh, I'm going to put this question to Together, and we are going to have an uh, extensive and thorough discussion uh, with Joanna. So without much ado, I would like us to have uh, a brief presentation uh, by Joanna looking at uh, obesity, where it stands in the world, and the key issues that we consider to be relevant for journalists. Uh, uh, Joanna, can we project uh, your uh, slides and uh, so that we can have that presentation right away? Sure. Thank you so much, Paul. It's, it's truly a pleasure to be here. And let me just get this organized so that this starts into slideshow. Great. So again, as, as Paul said, I'm Johanna Ralston. I'm CEO of World Obesity Federation. And I've been working in the area of non-communicable diseases, NCDs, for, uh, for more than 20 years globally. Um, and, uh, and actually feel that the role of journalists in accurately covering and telling the stories is incredibly, incredibly important. So it's truly, truly an honor, and I hope uh, the you know the first of many opportunities to be working with ICFJ and to be to be speaking with many of you today. Um, as you probably know, non-communicable diseases (NCDs) have have surpassed uh, all other causes of death and, and and did quite a while ago. NCDs include cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, 
and chronic respiratory diseases, as well as other, you know, uh, you know, diseases that affect smaller portions. But but essentially, those are the the main four driven by um, unhealthy diets, physical inactivity, tobacco, and um, harmful use of alcohol, among other things, just broadly. So I, I'm going to tell you a bit today about obesity globally. I did a couple of slides on on Africa because Paul and I had, had a really wonderful conversation around the time of World Obesity Day about obesity in Africa. And I think it's got some interesting, unique uh, issues and also is a story that's really unfolding before our eyes. And so I hope more people are focused on that story. We're also in the middle of this year of a food system summit that is a big UN event that will take place in, uh, in uh, September in New York. And um, it's focused on malnutrition in all its forms. And again, that does include on an overweight and obesity alongside undernutrition, which is, which is a big challenge in, in many uh, countries, um, low and middle income countries. Um, so we'll also speak about COVID and COVID and obesity. I'll tell you a bit about my organization at the end and then we'll talk. And I really am looking forward to a discussion with all of you who are here with us today on Facebook. Thank you again for joining. Um, so some basic facts, about 800 million adults and children are currently living with obesity. Um, we don't say obese people, we say living with obesity to try to really reinforce that it's a risk factor and a disease. It's, it's you know, you, you don't say, you know, you, whatever, it's, it's, it's showing that it's something that there is a person besides the disease. I'll tell you a little bit about that at the end. So again, about 150 million children and the, the rates of, of obesity among children are continuing to grow and are, are very alarming. Um, so it's really important that we address this. Worldwide obesity has nearly tripled since 1975 and has actually increased, I think, tenfold among children in the last, uh, since the 1970s. Um, between 1975 and 2016, children living with obesity yeah, grew, grew over to 18% of the population. Um, and that um, having obesity as a child uh, definitely makes it much more likely that you will have obesity in adulthood. And global obesity prevalence is expected to reach just in, in, uh, in four more years. 18% um, in men and more than, uh, more than one fifth of women will actually have obesity. I should say also, this doesn't, that number doesn't include overweight. So overweight is a body mass index BMI of between 25 and 30 and obesity is 30 and above. So um, overweight is, is, you know, those numbers are even sort of double this, um, the, the, the overweight challenge and over, overweight, you know, leads to obesity um, just shows that this is growing. So if you want to look just quickly along the timeframes, so we, if we look from 1980, 2000 and now the, the numbers and, and all the numbers in all the, all the countries in gray here are, are countries for which there just wasn't data collected or there just wasn't um, enough of a, a, anything meaningful um, to be collectible. Um, but that shows that there was certainly, obesity was becoming a real challenge in the US and in Finland actually, um, and, and other countries, but we, it wasn't really being measured systematically. Um, 20 years later, there was seriously a problem growing. And then now we look at, um, and this is among women, this figures, we look at, um, the fact that it's not just growing, but it's growing everywhere. Um, and that it's come to uh, many parts of Africa and Asia. And so it's really a, a growing challenge. These are similar figures for men. Um, there's not really that much different, but it's also helpful to see there are more women than men in Africa and in the Gulf region in particular with obesity. So that's one, one reason that we separate them out. And then if you look at young girls, children, or women under 18, you could say, these are the numbers here showing that again, very little uh, sort of overweight or obesity. So BMI, it's, you measure childhood obesity differently, but overweight or obesity was not a really big issue, um, you know, to, which is, you know, 40 years ago now, but how much it's grown um, and, and grown widely. So, and same thing with boys. So I think we can establish, and then just, this is a graph that's kind of helpful, which shows a lot of sort of the obesity prevalence rates are in the 28s, 30, it's you know quite high, um, or numbers of people living with obesity. Um, sort of number of people living with obesity, I should say, um, is is quite significant. Um, in the U.S., it's enormous. It's it's you know uh, approaching 100 million. Um, and um, but then you look down at the lower right. If you look at the Pacific Islands, um, you have prevalence of obesity. So percentage of the population living with obesity 
while it's you know in the U.S. it's 36. Uh, down in the in the many of the Pacific Islands, it's it's generally around 50 percent. So again, highest rates of obesity um, are in the um, small island developing states, the Caribbean, the Pacific Islands, um, and then also in places like the Gulf, as well as U.S., U.K., Mexico, and a few of these other countries here. Countries with the most rapid rise, though, to show that those countries that are not um, showing still probably relatively low obesity rates are increasing. So obesity may be leveling off somewhat in the higher, uh, co heavier countries, if you will, but it's growing in places that currently do not have a high obesity rate. And that's listed here. They are generally in Asia and Africa. Um, and um, But we've done some projections looking at both the increase in, in obesity over the next sort of 30, 40 years and the economic impact of that as a percentage of, of GDP and it's quite high. So it's very much, why do we have an obesity epidemic? Just simply, it's very complex, but soft drinks play a, a role. This increase in sugar sweetened beverages and their wide availability. Certainly there are places in the world where you cannot get clean water, but you can get soft drinks, um, which, is, which is, you know, that's, that's a really important point. For some people it's their, it's their beverage. Uh, physical inactivity, which has grown as we've become more urbanized. Um, genetics plays a huge role, much bigger role than people understand. And certainly um, the, you know, the, the, the genetics of your mother when she's pregnant with you matter, just as does her eating um, in terms of if you're going to be predisposed to obesity. Diseases and drugs can be associated with obesity. Um, some of them, it's a side effect and stress contributes to it. Ultra processed food, such as we see here on the top, you see normal uh, non-processed food. On the bottom, you see, you know, apple, you know, mango flavored popsicles, but there's nothing, there's no mango in them. There's no food in them. There's just chemicals. Fruit Loops, which are not actually anything to do with fruit. Meat products, which, which don't have much uh, resemblance to actual animal and soda. So um, these are some things that are, um, have contributed to it. This growth in portion sizes, Food has gotten cheaper and uh, over the years um, and, and there's just greater availability of it. But ultra processed foods, again, there's different unprocessed foods. It's fine to have, you know, if we cook, you process food essentially, but it's ultra processed foods that's really driving a lot of this and the foods, they, 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 it's generous to even call them food. What works, some of the things that work we'll tell you about are things like labeling, um, these things about that show high in sugar, high in calories, um, changing packaging, for example, um, as has been done with sugary cereals in Latin America, they went from having this very child-friendly image to no image, which just helps children to be less demanding of it. Um, these are some things that work. Understanding this as obesity through the life course and what's called the obesogenic environment. Um, but for World, World Obesity Federation, what we tried to do was really to show, think of obesity as a plant and that has lots of roots and there's food is very much one of them, but it's not the only one. Uh, there's stigma, there's genetic risk, there's lack of sleep plays a big role, biology plays a role, marketing, how heavily you're marketed to, access to healthcare, does your doctor understand that excess weight is unhealthy? Not necessarily, there's so many different drivers of it. If we look in Africa, for example, um, there's, um, there's certainly high rates of obesity, particularly as South African um, has some of the highest rates among women in the world, 41% you can see here. Um, and, uh, and, and countries where it's, where it's, uh, where it's growing. Um, and then you see on the bottom, the lower rates, places where it's low now, but actually is, is, was on that list showing what's growing quickly. A little bit more about um, obesity in Africa, just to say that um, the countries, the 20, you know, half of the, of the fastest rising countries with adult obesity are in Africa. Um, obesity also has a strong gender component in, in many African countries and comorbidities, which we would mean diabetes, cancer, et cetera, are also on the rise. We very much know diabetes is a very significant problem. So too is hypertension. Um, you know, African countries have some of the highest levels of hypertension in the world. Much, much related to much of these, this is the changing diet, the changing availability of food, particularly as you move into cities. Um, and some of the challenges to just um, lack of access to affordable, desirable, healthy food. Um, and junk food is marketed cheaply. And, and also there's been this sort of replacement of healthy crops and sovereign crops in many countries with, you know, being agri agribusiness, which sort of buys up the land and produces these cheap crops that contribute to high red meat consumption, high sugar, et cetera. 
So, but now we're going to go to COVID. Um, so what happened was very interesting. You know, in the past 15 months, our worlds, our lives have all changed. One thing we realized very quickly was not that COVID was, that obesity was causing COVID, although, you know, maybe someday we'll find out there's a relationship, but really that people with particularly severe obesity, so people at the higher end of the body mass index were, were uh, suffering terribly from COVID and much more likely to die. So we issued a report on that this year. It's not that when you have, your population is at 48%, it's low. And when it's at, you know, then it goes, you know, all of a sudden it goes up one day, but it's, this broadly just showed that the 10, the countries with the 10 lowest rates of, of COVID death were all low in obesity, except with one exception, the countries with the 10 highest rates were all high in obesity. So there was clearly a connection. What could it be? We don't fully understand yet, but we know that there's, this is a, this shows some of the factors that are driving this, but clearly that you're in an, when you're, when you have obesity, when you're carrying a lot of excess weight, first of all, you probably have comorbidities. You probably have diabetes and hypertension, and those are all going to work together to make you less healthy and less able to fight off a, a virus. But also you have an inflammatory response, essentially, that's, that's putting you just much more likely to have a very bad outcome. Um, so again, when we, when we did this report, which was launched on March 4th, now we have more than 3 million deaths, but at the time in the end of February, sadly, I mean, there's been a million since then, it's been, you know, more than 500,000 since then, um, 2.5 million had died, uh, 2.2 million were countries. We're not saying they were all had overweight or obesity, but they were in countries where there was high rates. So what does that mean? What's going on? Well, we know that that also means that they're likely, even if they don't have obesity themselves, countries with high rates of obesity have high rates of heart disease, have high rates of cancer. Um, if we look at the 10 lowest, the countries with the 10 lowest um, deaths per, per 100,000, they also had, you can see the third column here, they also had in the fourth column, low rates of um, adults being overweight with the exception of New Zealand and Papua New Guinea. In the 10 countries with the highest rates, US, UK, Belgium, Montenegro, mostly just Europe and US plus uh, Mexico, I think is number 11. They all had high rates of obesity, high rates of COVID death. But what about New Zealand, Iceland and Cuba, countries with high rates of obesity, but not high rates of COVID death? We think it's probably because they're small island states and we're able to close their borders. And, and as small island states, it's easier when government tells you to do something to do it. it it's not as sort of unruly as some larger uh, countries are. So wider impacts have strained food systems and supply chain. Um, there's been a lot of unhealthy marketing, reduced opportunities to be physically active. So people who are on the border of being obese or having obesity across that border also during lockdown. So there's been a lot of different factors that have contributed to this, um, eating, you know, increase in eating unhealthy food, being marketed to not being able to get health care. Recommendations for ways to treat this include public health approaches, but also, you know, working in the health system uh, to try to get help for this. Um, if we look at the WHO manifesto for a healthy and green COVID recovery, which they came out with at the, about a year ago, everything here is also good for obesity. So that's that's an important point. You know, uh, walkable cities, um, stop subsidizing fossil fuels that cause pollution and drive climate change. Climate change contributes to our unhealthy food systems. So just now to close out, and now I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. At World Obesity Federation, we are oriented around WHO and UN targets on obesity. Now over the past, you know, obesity has been understood as a problem for quite a while, but no one's known quite what to do about it. And we still don't have the perfect formula, but um, WHO and the UN passed targets, global targets saying no increase in adult and childhood obesity prevalence. This was a target that was passed in 2013. Um, there's also, uh, you know, a UN target around ending malnutrition in all its forms it's not being reached. And so therefore we at World Obesity are saying, we need to take the complexity of obesity and communicate that the roots of obesity that are driving, we're gonna communicate into a clear map forward, which we call roots, which is about recognizing obesity as a risk factor in a disease. That's the R. The second, the O is obesity monitoring and surveillance. The second O is obesity through the life course. That means childhood and adulthood obesity. T is about treatment, understanding that some people have obesity and we need to treat them in the primary care system or in the more secondary and tertiary care and systems, food systems, health systems, urban systems, transportation systems. So what we've tried to do is say, you can, you, you're not, we're not going to tackle obesity by doing one thing. We have to do five things or we have to do many things at the same time. 
and they all fit into this root strategy. Um, in, on World Obesity Day, I just wanted to mention when we issued this report, what we were shocked by was how much enormous coverage there was on the day. So this link between COVID and obesity, which, which we know is associated with, again, how unhealthy people with obesity, severe obesity actually are, huge reach on the day itself. And interestingly, Boris Johnson issued a uh, launched a hundred million pound um, budget in the UK government to address obesity. Now, actually, uh, states and cities in, in the UK are looking for ways to spend this money that they have to spend. Um, and it was really in in, in recognition that that um, Boris himself, this is important, has obesity or had it. He got COVID. He was very sick, and he understands now what it means. And he has therefore made this a priority. And there's actually many political leaders who are carrying extra weight, and I think who, who are going to be more attentive if you're trying to reach people. Um, so we work through these different reports. And again, we ask you to come to our website, www.worldobesity.org. And we have this report on obesity of missing the targets for, for, for adults and children, which came out in March 2020, showing those targets that I showed you earlier for the WHO and the UN we're not missing, we're doing terrible on, and, and we need to do much more. We were saying that for a long time and then COVID happened and showed what the consequences are of not doing something about obesity. So it was a, a perfect storm where we're able to get more attention. The Atlas of Childhood Obesity, which also shows how we're doing in terms of children, which again is also not, not good. We're doing a terrible job globally. And each of these includes report cards for every country in the world. So you as journalists can go to these and find a report card on your country on how they're doing, what are the particular drivers of obesity in, in your country or your countries that you're focused on, and, and, uh, and then look at the resources that can help. Um, and then finally, again, the 2021 Atlas, which I think shows in very concrete terms these how many people are dying. And what I would say is now that we've looked, that's, that's looking backwards, but if we look ahead to preparing for the next pandemic, which I think we have to live in a world where we are, we are we're, we couldn't have stopped the pandemic by stopping by addressing obesity. We could have stopped a lot of people dying and a lot of the economic toll that happened from having to close down so that healthcare systems wouldn't be overwhelmed. Meaning that we could next time we need to we need to get our arms around this and really do something uh, about overweight and obesity worldwide. Um, so um, sorry, I uh, just went backwards. Also, this is a report that's coming out soon that it will provide additional tools and it will soon have information for every country in the world, again, on the World Obesity website, which shows um, we're piloting it in the eight countries listed here, Brazil, Mexico, Thailand, South Africa, India, Australia, Saudi, and Spain. But we are looking at what is the, per the impact on gross domestic GDP of obesity, of the hospitalizations, of the health costs, of the lost productivity. So that helps to support investment in, in just what the UK has done, obesity prevention and people who are who already have obesity um, not managing this. So we also have lots of stories from our global community. And I think obviously we know stories matter. These are on the worldobesityday.website, but we also have them in the regular website. So they, uh, to the person telling that story can be very powerful. My last point, and then I want to hear from all of you, is it's very important to not use stigmatizing language. One of the issues is that I think initially people understood overweight and obesity as just a sign of weakness or laziness. Now we know there's a much more complex genetic storm behind it. And we know that things like the food that people have availability to, which, which you know, the poorer people are, the cheaper the food is. And then that, that means that the less healthy it often is, unfortunately. Uh, there's much many drivers, and yet we we portray people with obesity as bringing this on themselves. We we don't even show their face. It's just this very anonymous, uh, judgmental picture, um, and we say. And so we want it, we want to encourage people to also use language that you know to to use positive images of people with obesity, showing we are all in this family together, and many of us, in fact, have overweight or obesity. And sort of positive messages, and then also should say people with obesity rather than obese people. Um, suffer from obesity. Um, it's better to say have obesity. So um, and 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 not having these photos of people eating unhealthy food. So that's that's that. And I'm going to stop sharing now, <laughs> so that Paul and I can talk. Thank you very much. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, I hope mean uh, uh, introduction that really sets uh, the ground for 
uh, a lot of conversations on the issues of obesity in different parts of the world. So uh, I'd like to start with uh, the complexity uh, of obesity uh, itself. And uh, do you think uh, the definition of obesity outside what the uh, WHO and international health organizations define as obesity. Uh, how do you think individual countries' uh, cultural perspective of obesity, how, do, how does this uh, element uh, impact uh, local response to obesity? Well, so I think you're, you're getting at a really interesting question, which is how different countries perceive excess weight. And so I think with, with a definition of obesity, besides classifying it from BMI, we have to think of it as, as um, unhealthy weight. It's, it's, it's about unhealthy weight. Um, in many countries, and some of the countries I was showing like the Pacific Islands, um, there has traditionally been a really positive view of, of excess weight of the, you know, it means that you're wealthy. <laughs> um, it's seen as attractive. It's seen as sexy. Um, and, and that's fine. I mean, I think we're not, nobody here wants to, to say a, a big body cannot be a beautiful body at all, but, but we do know that overweight and obesity dramatically increase your risk of cardiovascular disease, of cancer, of diabetes, and those are problems. So we just want to focus on unhealthy weight. So I think different countries, you have to tailor the messages based on local attitudes. Although we're, it's interesting because we have a new stigma working group at the World Obesity Federation that includes people from all over the world. And one thing we're hearing is that the younger generations are not, not as big fans of, of the bigger weight. They, they tend to be more following um, the ideal is more and more becoming that more Western model for lack of a better term of, of a thinner body um, being more preferable. But it's really important to, to understand what the, what the, what the cultural uh, attitudes are definitely about, about overweight and obesity. No, okay, so um, one of the issues that comes to mind uh, when I talk about obesity or when I report on obesity or any other health issue is the access to available data sets. And um, mm -hmm. in, in making this uh, interpretation, making the conclusion that uh, COVID-19, uh, people that have obe uh, obesity are 10 times, uh, the chance of dying from COVID-19 is 10 times higher in them. Um, so how did uh, access to data uh, imp uh, impact um, this particular conclusion? And uh, why do you think in some countries, uh, I, because I went through the reports myself and I saw that some countries, uh, inferences were made based on data sets that were produced in 2016, 2017, not latest data. So how do you think these actually impact uh, COVID, uh, obesity country measures? So the availability of data, I think it's an incredibly important question because um, because I think obesity hasn't really been understood as a as a as well as other things as a disease is what I would say. It doesn't get so there's there's the global burden of disease which measures a lot of that's what what it, what we use to understand a lot of disease burden. They don't they don't describe obesity as a disease, although the World Health Organization does. They just think of it as a they just describe it as a risk factor for other diseases. Um, so you wind up getting a, you, there's not a really great accurate picture of obesity. So like anything that's kind of, we're still building the science around and building the evidence around, um, you have to just kind of trust good estimates that have had a lot of rigor. Um, but we at the World Obesity Federation, we have the Global Obesity Observatory, which includes data, the best possible data from every country in the world. Now we try to use measured data um, but we also use estimates where where measure data are not available. Um, so I think it's I think it's um, but we do hope that global burden of disease will start to really list obesity as a disease because then that I think will show countries how serious a problem this is and in a ways that they're just not doing right now. Um, but a lot of countries do do report on BMI not a, not in a standard way, and that's helpful at least. It's it's a, it's something. It's good. It's not perfect. <laughs> so. But data is never oh, yes. perfect. <laughs> yeah. okay. uh, of course, uh, yeah. of course. Then, um, still on the issue of data, many uh, the BMI uh, is the uh, is the standard is the most popular way of measuring uh, 
or determining whether somebody is obese or not. But we have a question uh, that asks about why do we still rely on BMI uh, as an indicator of health or what person is obese or not when it is based only on the height and width of a person. It has been claimed to be an inaccurate measure of body fat content and does not take into account muscle mass, bone density, overall body yeah. composition, and mm -hmm. visual and sex difference according to some research. So what is your take on this? It's a, it's absolutely, well, I wouldn't say it's not inaccurate. It's just in imperfect. It's very imperfect, but it is simple enough to do. And so it's a place to start, but it's a kind of lowest common denominator. Um, the, um, there are definitely other, so one example, I guess, is if you're a, a very fit rugby player, you could you could still have a BMI that 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 looks you know that that would call you obese or say that you have obesity, but you're actually really healthy. Your heart's healthy. You're just big and you have a lot of muscle mass. Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, I don't think has a BMI that would make him obese, but it but it but but some athletes do have so much muscle mass that they would be, if you just used BMI, they would be uh, you'd get an inaccurate picture of their of their health and of their state. So I think it's, I think it's BMI, it needs to be, what we need to move into is BMI plus probably one or two other measures. It's just that it's not, there's not really complete agreement on what those should be. There's things like hip, hip waist ratio. Uh, there's, there's differences in, in India. There, there tends to be more of the adiposity sitting around the, 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 the middle section than, you know, in, in other countries. So, so something, there needs to be a measure that would work in different, different cultures and different countries with sometimes different kind of uh, physical, you know, average physical um, uh, types. So, yeah. Yes. I'll but BMI understand. is good though. BMI is good. It's just not enough at all. <laughs> okay. Of course, I agree with you. Uh, yeah. Still, because um, I think uh, the approach would be something, uh, Having something instead of having nothing uh, would be uh, the implication. Then um, still on that, maybe one of the last questions on that, uh, that is we have another question that says uh, much of the country that are used to compare uh, COVID-19 death rates and the correlation with obesity are places where data is underreported or not reported for a while. How can this data be reliable for making uh, these connections? And how do we deal with issues such as obesity that may be stemming, uh, that may be stemming from them, uh, but you can't see because of unreliable data? So what role does data play in combating obesity? I don't know what Sorry, I Sorry, can you thing. repeat the first part of that question? I don't think I fully understood the- Okay, the first question says, uh, the first part of the question says, how do you deal with issues uh, such as, um, such as uh, obesity that may be stemming uh, from uh, un unavailable, underreported, or unavailable, or long lack of latest data, and uh, what role does data play in combating obesity? Mm -hmm. No, I think it's that's a that's a, that's important. I think that um, I mean, as I said, I think we we I don't actually think data data is very much. A problem, lack of lack of good data, and and you will see if you visit our global obesity observatory that we have really tons of data for some countries, and and they tend to be more in Europe and the U.S. and high income countries, um, and and much less for other countries. But I do think that there are um, there's there's different. You know, we also use multiple data sources to see are there good proxy measures, including diabetes, because we know that a high portion of people with type 2 diabetes will have overweight and obesity, for example. So are there kind of other measures that might be good proxies until we have a robust surveillance system in place, for example? Um, and, and that's part of the ROOTS framework, as I said, obesity monitoring and surveillance is one of the O's, because we know that data, data is, is everything, but data isn't always the easiest thing. You need to build a surveillance system. Um, and, and part of that, that's partly why I also emphasize if it's understood as a disease, then you need to be measuring it as a disease. So, um, but underreporting kind of really varies. Um, we try to use, again, as I said, I think the, one of the reasons I, you know, we try to use measured data, not self-reporting, because we see that as the best form of, 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 uh, of reliable data. Um, and that is, that's obviously one way around it as well 
in some places we can't and we have to use just estimates extrapolating from other countries. I hope I, well, uh, hope I got that. Unfortunately, uh, Joanna, there are lots of questions that okay. I'm, I'm not sure I'll be able to even put in my own personal questions, but I think it's better I take most of the questions from the audience. So sure, sure. Oh, there's a follow up question to the one you just took and uh, the person is explaining, I meant for instance, for places in the global south, for instance, Tanzania has not reported death uh, since last April. So how can we make these connections and help people there? I think the question is about places where uh, the latest data are not available. How can mm -hmm. we, and we have to be able to still draw connection between obesity and COVID-19. So when data is yeah. not available, how can reporters report on that country? Well, I think that is where, where a little bit of peer pressure of countries else around Tanzania can be helpful, that if there's a similar uh, profile if the population is similar. So I'm assuming that the Kenyan numbers might be helpful there to place pressure on, I mean, I'm thinking place place pressure on government and on donors and on WHO to, to, to acknowledge that obesity and overweight and obesity in Tanzania should be addressed if we want to be certainly preventing the next pandemic and while well managing this one. Um, and I think there's a lot we'll find out about, about um, about the, there's a lot we are finding out about the weaknesses in our health systems and our monitoring and surveillance because of COVID that will um, extend to, to understanding, not understanding the, the, the burden of obesity in many countries. I think we'll, we'll understand it's much higher than we even thought once, once we are out of the crisis of COVID and that's gonna take a good long time and able to look at you know, what, what worked and what really didn't work. Um, and, and I think a lot of health system surveillance didn't work and, and that's unfortunate, but that's where you can use a little bit of peer pressure or, or comparisons by countries that are similar and, and nearby, I would say. Yeah, so uh, Sharon wants to know whether, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, that obesity is a gendered issue. Uh, Sharon would like an elaboration on that. So I would say it's in some places. So in the Gulf, for example, you have a culture where people don't go outside that much. I mean, if you've been to, to Gulf countries, you know that it's as much as, you know, 30, 40, 50 degrees um, often, and and there's not sidewalks and things. Um, but there's, I mean, that's unfair because that's changing too. But um, it's much more typical for women to be stuck at home um, and with limited opportunities to move and to be outside. And also a culture actually of hospitality around food that can sometimes, that can contribute to uh, carrying a lot of extra weight. Um, so that's that's one way. So women's, you know, women not being sort of having the opportunities to be out and about um, in some countries and in others, it's it's um, it is that sense of of um, one of our, you know, for World Obesity Day, we had we had people from all over the world advise us on our imagery. And one of my colleagues from Kenya who works in the Heart Foundation said, you know, if you go to a woman a wedding and the woman isn't plump. Everybody, you know, the bride isn't plump. Everybody will say to the man, "You need to, you need to fatten her up to show that you're successful." You know, there's like a, there's cultural issues like that that are that are that are sort of gendered in that sense. Um, but it does have to do both with with you know staying home um, and having very limited access to physical activity, and then also um, the 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 sort of the weight gain that that is associated with pregnancy. Um, and be, having a obesity problem before pregnancy because, or having a weight problem before pregnancy can often turn into having an obesity problem after you've had one or two or three pregnancies and, uh, and that just doesn't, that cycle begins and is very hard to get out of. And um, yes, uh, the issue of uh, the gender connection between uh, obesity and um, uh, and is not something that is just peculiar to one country alone. I think it's something um, that is uh, that is being practiced in many countries, uh, especially in Africa, and maybe there are experiences elsewhere too. And uh, which brings me to the issue of um, uh, there are some drivers of obesity that are strong, really strong. And uh, very few individuals or organizations or governments are willing to take them on. Uh, let me give you a quick background. Uh, mm -hmm. In a country like uh, in South Africa, South Africa uh, seems to be one of the very few countries in Africa with a major uh, sugar tax, uh, sugar tax 
and mm -hmm. uh, and when they do in the dialogues that led up to the introduction of the policy of the law, we saw the sugar man, the sugar players, uh, the beverage industries threatening yeah. citizens that tens of thousands of jobs will be lost. I don't think yeah. any political leader would want to take that gamble. And uh, so when we have that uh, threat to the political ambition of visionary leaders, and coupled with the fact that there are some cultural elements that ensures that obesity is deeply rooted uh, in the practice and daily lives of the people. So how does the, a particular journalist that is interested in uh, reporting this issue go about trying to look at it from the solutions perspective, especially when there seems to be a reluctance uh, to try something else. I think you're you're. It, it's a very. It's it's actually a little bit scary, how um, some companies and not all. A lot of companies are trying to do the right thing partly because it's good for business to have a healthy population that stays alive so you can continue, you know, but there are companies and there are parts of companies that have very, very, very um, harmful practices and place pressure on governments. We've seen it in, yes, South Africa, it's, it's happened in many countries where this sort of, you know, we will build you a big new plant and guarantee you employment if you, uh, if you back off from taxing sugar sweetened beverages. It's really unfortunate because the answer lies in our hands, which is if we could think of ourselves as sort of people centered and what's healthy for people, you can sell them tasty products. You just, they just don't have to be so unhealthy. That actually is a possibility. And, and um, but it's this kind of near termism that happens and, and it's very, very, very uh, distressing. So it's hard to get government to partner and agree to sugar sweetened beverage tax. However, I actually think that the momentum is, is, is really strong for SSB taxes. I think the way it happened in Mexico City was pulling together a very strong civil society coalition. So there was a lot of barriers in Mexico, you know, in Mexico in general, in Mexico City in particular to getting the SSB tax approved. But, it, um, but once, once this civil society voice just kept growing and growing and having very, very powerful messages that particularly address the audience, really wonderful billboards showing uh, people as parents. You know, I mean, I think that's, we would all do, you know, for ourselves, we may not take care of ourselves, but we will always take care of our children. Um, th that in particular was one of several factors that made them have a very successful campaign that led to sort of more federal um, success in the campaign. And then that became a model for other countries. Um, so I think it's, I think we need to, to, to acknowledge that, but to understand that, yes, the force, the force of the, the potential influence of, of companies on governments uh, can make it very hard to, to, to get those taxes in place, but it's not impossible at all. Okay, uh, now, so we are back to connecting uh, COVID-19 now uh, with, uh, with obesity. Uh, Chidindu Madu Okoli is asking, uh, can we say that the lockdown as a whole, uh, can we say the lockdown is a sole factor that contributed to the increasing cases of people living with obesity during COVID-19? And uh, in preparing for epidemics subsequently, uh, what factors do you think uh, we can put in place to solve for physical inactivity during quarantine, especially for older adults? Yeah. No, I think lockdown was absolutely not the only reason. So, I mean, what the there's two things. So there's the people who already had overweight and obesity before before COVID happened, they immediately got sick. You know, if they were exposed to COVID, they got much sicker than the average person. So there, there's that. And that that just that is something that, you know, their obesity certainly was driven by things like physical inactivity, but that's a separate issue. But the but the increase in weight um, was not just certainly wasn't just because of physical inactivity. I think more than anything, it was physical inactivity plus um, unhealthy foods. And some of that was um, passive. It was, there wasn't, there was less availability of different kinds of food. I think we've all experienced that during lockdown, mm -hmm. but, but some of it was active in terms of the aggressive marketing. I mean, even in the US where I'm currently based, there was, you know, cris crispy cream, there was a donut company that I actually think in, in 
probably had some good intention on some level of saying, let's, we're going to give free donuts to people who have gotten their vaccine. <laughs> but, uh, but it just doesn't quite, it's, and I think eventually there was an uproar and they, they backed down, which is also shows us how important it is to, to, to report well on these stories. But, um, but I think it's, I think um, in terms of the preparedness question, we need comprehensive national plans to address overweight and obesity. We need obesity to be understood in the health system. So when somebody has overweight or obesity, they, they can get treatment and not wait until they develop a comorbidity like diabetes or cancer. I mean, there are things that we need that, will, that, that can help very much reduce the number of people who had to get severely ill and die. Um, we can't, we can't, uh, stopping obesity won't prevent the next epidemic, but it will certainly prevent a lot of mortality from it. Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, so we have a question from David, a journalist from Czechia, and uh, uh -huh. he, he, he writes, uh, uh, one of the, Czechia is one of the countries you listed on the yeah. bad side uh, of the COVID list. So uh, uh, my que his question has to do with the pandemic. So he writes, uh, as we saw the COVID, COVID situation over there, uh, the topic were not about the opacity, but more about the wrong decisions of the government. Do mm -hmm. you think there is a strong connection between the obesity rate and the death rate, even in Czechia, or there could have been some other casualties that caused the high death toll? Right. Well, so I mean, I'm gonna. There's two ways I'm gonna answer that. So first of all, we're not saying that obesity caused the death. It might have been that we'll do more research and we'll find out it was everybody who had a high severe obesity had diabetes. And actually, what we know is that, like age, obesity is a very good way of predicting COVID death. If that makes sense, it doesn't necessarily. It's just a correlation. We don't know exactly why, and we're gonna find out more. There may be some other. Some some other element, but but you know so that's that's part of it. Um, but it's so if you want to predict who is going to die or who is going to have high death rates, look at the obesity rate. I think that's the that's one of the takeaways, and that should that should at least be a guide. Um, in terms of what are some other what other causalities, I absolutely think there's a lot about this. This is only conjecture because we don't we don't know, but um, why? But but certainly. That's why I put up the slides of New Zealand, Cuba, and Iceland, smaller countries where there's probably more just inherently you listen to what the government does and you can control the borders. They did better. So that, that tells you that ability to actually control borders is important. And certainly countries where there had been that, again, that lived experience, which of a previous SARS, which would be many countries in Asia, there was also people remembered what, what the earlier SARS um, was like. And at the highest levels, the decision makers, the policy makers, everybody remembered and knew that it was helpful. So I think there's that lived experience. And then those all sort of translate into, um, you know, there's a, there's a, a, is it a country where you tend to listen to policymakers and follow the rules too? I think that that, that probably plays a role. Oops, I've lost you there, Paul. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, no, I'm, I'm, oh, okay. I'm here. I'm, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. So uh -huh. so, uh, I was going to answer the questions myself <laughs> if I needed to. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can, they're right here. <laughs> no, I'm here, I'm here. Uh, so uh, one thing that I think uh, I've personally experienced while trying to report on um, COVID uh, publicity is the difference uh, in terms of uh, local measures, uh, local measures towards addressing the issue of obesity. Uh, I stay in Nigeria, and while I was doing a story on COVID nineteen, I spoke. Uh, I interviewed a person that heads the obesity society, and uh, so the focus for them uh, is they are just starting, and they are looking at how they can educate healthcare professionals. Now, even yeah. the healthcare professionals themselves have a poor understanding of how mm -hmm. to handle obesity. Yeah. Actually, when it comes in the light of comorbidities, they instead choose to focus on the comorbidities yeah. and treat uh, the, uh, the obesity itself. Now, looking at this, uh, the fact that not every country is at the same level in terms of fighting uh, obesity. So what do you think can be achieved across board? And what do you think, irrespective of the state that a particular country is in its fight against COVID-19, it can also quickly catch on? Well, it's a great question. So I think I think um, it's interesting. We're you know I think I mentioned last time we're we're starting we're we're in the early stages of a new coalition with the World Health Organization and UNICEF, 
And we're broadly prioritizing three areas. And one is just what you described. It's actually obesity prevention and management in primary care, but really trying to say this is, you need to have a way of, you need primary care needs to understand that obesity requires um, attention uh, just as you would, you would address diabetes. Um, so that's, that's one way. And, and I think ideally we, if you had obesity in medical education and in, in medical school education, that would help. The second is there's so much we can do on the regulatory environment, which is changing the obesogenic environment. So that is things like tax and uh, labeling. Um, and, and so those are things that every country can do and, uh, and, and that helps. And then the third is interestingly, um, changing the narrative. I think changing the narrative to how we, we talk about obesity, how we report on obesity, not using stigmatizing words and images helps because then you take away this shame and blame uh, piece, which is not only not helpful, but actually harms people and isn't accurate. It's, it's based on the wrong information that somehow the individual is entirely to blame for, for their, their excess and unhealthy weight. So I think even those three things, it's narrative, regulatory environment, and, um, and obesity in, in primary care, and, and more broadly in the health system, uh, are, th are things that every country can do. And, uh, and, and you don't need to, to be a doctor or a specialist to, to do them all, and, and that's really important. Then um, still on the issue of um, what uh, local actions, uh, is there a way to actually access and grade what individual country is doing and uh, what is going to be the standard, the gold standard, if such exists? Well, so in our report called Missing the Targets in 2020, which is on our website, that's again, every country, technically every member state had signed on saying they were going to reduce, they were going to keep obesity prevalence, you know, not rising, um, starting in sort of a 2013 and, and, uh, and, and malnutrition. And and they no, no country is, has is anywhere near that that target. But it those report cards lists a lot of factors of what um, what uh, could be driving it. It shows how much fresh fruit production there is at consumption, vegetable consumption, soda consumption. Um, do they have taxes and you know in place? Do they recognize obesity as a disease and therefore you know at least start to look at it in the health system? All of those things uh, we see as what needs to happen. So we do have these report cards, which I hope that you can all use. They're free, they're on our website that can really um, kind of tell that story um, a little bit better and show these are really the ingredients that are gonna contribute to, um, to addressing unhealthy weight. Then um, there is a thin mm -hmm. line uh, between, uh, for journalists uh, that are trying to express, uh, uh, reports on COVID, on obesity, uh, which is how do we report that this is a crisis? How do we report that there are things that individuals can do uh, mm -hmm. to reduce their risk of uh, having obesity without stigmatization? Yeah. So, oh well, there's. Uh, do you have an approach to it? Yeah, absolutely. So I want to I want to call out. We have the the uh, World Obesity Federation has um, and for for reporting we have an image bank. Of, of pictures of lots of different ethnicities um, where people look, you know, are, are carrying excess weight, but look happy and, and are very respectful. So using our image bank, we also have colleagues at the European Association for the Study of Obesity and other places who also have image banks. And so those pictures exist. So that's one thing is use the good pictures. We always ask the journalists to. And, um, and then use the language. And we have, we have uh, guidelines on, on language, which come from our colleagues at Obesity Action Coalition um, on the right language to use as to, to describe people respectfully. So that's, that's just a first there. Um, in terms of, um, I'm sorry, the first part of your question, I've completely forgotten. You've, I just answered the second part of your question and forgot the first part, <laughs> sorry. What was, yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, the, the answer you are giving me is also leading me to, uh, to another question, which is uh, what are the wrong, what are the major wrong languages that you think journalists are always using that is wrong while reporting COVID-19? So if you can just give us a few examples of this before we go back to how to report COVID-19, okay. uh, to describe it as a problem, but without stigmatizing the patient. Well, yeah, I think it's, I think it's, 
it's it's also saying he's you know this person you'd say he's not an obese person you say he has obesity um you don't you don't say he's you know um it's all his fault you know he's blaming blaming the individual for it um or it's all the parents fault can't they stop they're weak they're uh, you know, they're weak is one of the big ones, that they're weak, they have no willpower. If obesity has increased by, by you know, 300% in the last 40 years, it's not like people got three times as weak. You know what I mean? It's not like everybody suddenly became greedy. You know, I think that's just another way of looking at it. And especially if, if childhood obesity has increased by 10, you know, tenfold, it's not like children became 10 times more greedy. It's there's something in their environment that's obviously changed. And that's a big part of it. Um, so, so I think it's it's really moving from individual blame to not societal blame, but societal responsibility. It's a shared responsibility. I think that's the that's the language to use. And, but again, try to avoid saying obese person and say person with obesity. It really helps to to show that human that person as, as having this, not being this, and that's really helpful. So, but your earlier question was about reporting on COVID and obesity. And I think, I think what's been interesting about this is that because it takes a very long time for obesity and for other NCDs, other non-communicable diseases to, to make you very sick and to kill you, they, it's been harder for them to get the attention that infectious disease has gotten, even though, and I don't, infectious disease should get the attention, it deserves it, but but it's been harder to, cre to create a sense of urgency because it happens over a long time. Um, and it happens much longer than people are in elected officials are in office. So it's hard to get attention for it. However, what COVID has done is actually show, particularly in obesity, that this is something that usually is longstanding, but you will quickly die from if you have COVID. And that actually, so that, that kind of time frame. Um, is in a way why reporting on obesity and COVID is a really more uh, attention grabbing story, quite frankly, which then helps get more political attention for it and people taking it more seriously and thinking about it. Um, I think hopefully that'll, that answers that question. Oh yes, uh, I, think, uh, I think it does. Um, yeah. Then uh, if I, uh, if, oh, okay. So, um, Okay, uh, this person was just uh, greeting. I thought that was a question. And uh, so uh, back to my lines of question, when we look at um, the responses and uh, in some local organizing groups that I've spoken to, they said um, there is this uh, overwhelming nature of what is expected to be done. For instance, they have to talk about policy. They have to talk or engage policy. Uh, policy makers to make the right rules. They have to educate the general public. They have to talk about uh, looking at this from a whole point of view. Uh, but if you have, when I visited your website to look at local organizations, local partners, the organization is partnering with, uh, in some countries, they are very, very few, just one. For instance, I think for Nigeria, we only have one organization that uh, the society, the federation officially uh, identifies with. Uh, why is it, as if uh, there are not enough local partners to be the foot soldiers that would enable the desired goals that has been set, that the world has not been meeting uh, to be able to be achieved. There are many organizations that are involved in the fight against HIV. So how come is it that we only have like one organization per country that is officially recognized in combating obesity? Well, and in some countries, there's no organization. Um, I think it's because it goes back to, well, first of all, in some countries, it's the Heart Foundation that's doing it. Um, or, you know, in South Africa, we work with, we have a South African Association for the Study of Obesity, but we also work with the South African uh, Heart and Stroke Foundation because they understand and as part of heart and stroke that they, that they, uh, that obesity is becoming almost what tobacco used to be in terms of driving a lot of heart disease. So, so it, it might not have obesity in the name. I think that's part of it, but lots of diabetes organizations, lots of heart organizations are very concerned about it. We believe that there's a real opportunity for national alliances around obesity um, that, uh, that, that are you know, from pulling from different groups that are concerned about it. And, um, and I think, but I think the reason it hasn't, it's only now kind of coming up in, in terms of people's attention is, 
is again that um, you know it hadn't been taken seriously as a as a disease. It was seen as something that could just be solved by telling people to eat less, move more, and that turns out to not be true at all. That it's it's much more complex and needs a a health systems approach as well as as approaches in other areas. So um, so I think it's a better environment for it, and I think it is partly convening other groups as well. And then finding strong people who can talk about it, champions is always helpful. I know the person who founded the Nigerian Obesity Society is living, has been living at an unhealthy weight herself. And she says it's hard to get people to pay attention to that, but, um, but she's very willing to talk about it. It's finding those champions and, and, and working with them. So. And then uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things that I think one of the, uh, one of the approaches uh, that, uh, is, that you, you've already described as effective is the reformulation uh, that, uh, that would enable the beverage industries to avoid the sugar tax uh, that, mm -hmm. that would pose on them. Um, now we have even most of the, a lot of these major companies that are producing these sugar beverages are also having reformulated uh, versions uh, of their products, even though they are not aggressively marketing them and promoting them. But uh, some consumers know the difference, even though we, are, we still believe that a zero sugar containing pro beverage product will not have the same concentration, but some customers still see the difference mm -hmm. in, these, in the ways these particular products taste. And we still always go prefer uh, the sugar option. Uh, do you think, uh, what is it to these uh, reformulation technology? Uh, do you think uh, there is still room for improvement? Or do you think uh, people should, uh, do you think they have to taste alike? And uh, or do you think uh, the industry, in terms of the technology and the approaches or suggestions that have been market, they are already good enough? I don't know whether you got my question. Yeah, I think so. Um, so a couple of things. It takes a while to change your taste. I was um, I was diagnosed with cancer, and I wound up changing my diet a lot after that because I started to read a lot more about it, and I missed my salty, fatty foods. Um, but over time, I find that I, I think, the, you know, part of it is my tastes have changed. I also don't completely rule out, you know, I think sometimes it's okay to have a snack. We, we want healthy diets, but it doesn't mean we have to, every single thing we eat all the time has to be healthy. Um, you know, I think, so, so that's key. You can have a piece of cake uh, sometimes. That was my birthday yesterday, so I had cake, you know? <laughs> um, but um, but so, so I think that's, that's part of it is it does take time to change tastes. I think that, um, Product reformulation is really important. And um, I think tastes generally have changed. Demand has changed a lot over the last 20 or so years in places where, you know, places like, so, so many places where you now have like vegan burgers and things like that, that wouldn't have been available 20 years ago and people want that and like it um, and understand that it matters. Um, so I think it's possible to change, you know, demand a bit as well for, for, uh, for different types of foods. And I also think that continuing to encourage companies and probably incentivizing companies, maybe with tax breaks and things to, to invest more money into research on reformulation um, can, can definitely uh, continue to be positive as well. No, uh, as an expert in this field, that you know this industry inside out, than many individuals, than many journalists. Uh, what aspect of the fight, global fight against obesity, do you think uh, remains underreported that journalists can still help put the satellite on? Well, I do think that this obesity and COVID relationship is is still, although we've we've been really pleased with how much coverage it's got, it needs to. It, you know that and and preparing for the next pandemic which you know we need to be unfortunately thinking about um is uh is 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 definitely need needs more coverage um the other is just this whole idea of um obesity in the in the health system that that um that you know we really need some a lot of doctors and and nurses and healthcare professionals uh, they they have a lot of bias against the person with obesity. They don't understand it. They don't know much about it. So that kind of that's an interesting angle, I think. And if there were much better understanding of obesity in the health system, there would be much 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 greater outcomes for people with obesity. So I think those are a couple of the stories. And the the childhood obesity story is a really important one because 
you really can't argue that it's the fault of the child that they have obesity. I mean, anybody who says it is, people will then say, oh, it's the parents, but you know, we know it's more, more, much more complex than that. Um, so everybody wants what's best for our children. And I think the childhood obesity story is an incredibly important and powerful one. So I think there's lots of different, there's, it's also obesity is a very interesting topic because there's so much to it. Um, and so hopefully that can, you know, journalists can understand how it cuts across so many different areas and can be a really um, very interesting way of looking, looking at different issues. Then um, what, um, how uh, is your federation, uh, what arrangements or what kinds of assistance are you willing to provide to journalists that are interested in covering obesity? We're very happy to talk to journalists. Just contact us and you can, I can even put my name in the, in the chat. You're free to, uh, I'll put my I email address. So. Somebody asked specifically for your email address. So let them have an email address that journalists can always send uh, messages to in case they need anything from the Federation to yeah. guide their obesity reports. Yes, yeah, so I'll do also info at world obesity dot. Well, what I'll do is I'm actually gonna put you in touch with our, um, our uh, comms person here too. So you can, because if you're a journalist, you'd want to reach to her name is Ellie Needs. Um, but feel free to contact us. We're happy to talk to journalists. We know what an important role you're playing in, uh, in this and, uh, and I'm really happy to talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we're already beyond past uh, time. Hour, yeah. Past yeah. time. But as we conclude, uh, what do you think uh, the key message uh, for an ideal story on obesity uh, should be? And um, how do you think uh, journalists that are interested in covering obesity can continue to be interested uh, beyond uh, COVID nineteen? Um, so I think it's that obesity is, everybody is vulnerable and everybody is part of the solution. I think that's, that's one, one key message because um, we did, for World Obesity Day, our messaging was everybody needs everybody because we, it's, it's, we all have a part to play in this. Um, that is, that's, that's one main message. Um, and and it, is, it is a health challenge and there are solutions inside and outside the health system. Then, so um, then um, are there any uh, events uh, that uh, the organization or any platform or any forum uh, that the Federation is putting together that you think can also be of benefit uh, to our journalists? Absolutely. So we do, we actually had a webinar at the exact time to the same time as this, as this webinar. <laughs> we, um, we run different meetings and webinars on our, on our site. And so we would welcome you. I'm not sure the next one might not be until um, later in May or June, but that's something that we really encourage you to, uh, to come and, and listen and, and come to our website and explore it and, and sign up to receive information about, about our webinars and other, other information that's going on. Um, and yeah, and, and to just to, to, to request to receive material. We, we have you know, activities going on all the time. And then we also have wonderful member organizations all around the world who run their own events and webinars and hopefully in-person meetings um, that, um, that, that could be of interest to, to the journalists as well. There's lots and lots going on. So we're, we're, we're very, very busy and, um, and, uh, and really wanna hear from all of you. So I really appreciate this, Joanna, for Thank actually you. taking time out to sure. own our invitation and uh, to be with us uh, today. And uh, so uh, for everyone joining us on Facebook and on Zoom, I really want to thank you uh, for joining us. And I hope this uh, webinar helps inform you better on the topic of obesity and uh, COVID-19 and importantly helps inspire uh, potential new angles for stories. And uh, if you're not a member of the ICFJ Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum uh, yet, uh, I encourage you to please uh, find the group on Facebook. And uh, for more information uh, about this initiative, uh, please visit uh, www.icfj.org. And if you would like to uh, access uh, additional uh, resources, journalism resources on COVID-19, uh, please check out uh, the internet, International Journalist Network uh, at www.igenet.org. And uh, please, uh, to every participant on this uh, on this uh, call, uh, please uh, don't forget to fill out uh, a survey 
ICFJA that is coming to your inbox uh, after this webinar. And the reason is that uh, the ICFJA uh, would love uh, your feedback uh, to improve uh, programming uh, for the series. So I've really had an amazing time. I've been inspired, I've been enlightened, I've been educated, and also uh, I've, I've had my uh, my knowledge about uh, obesity further expanded. So I really want to thank Joanna and everyone at the World Obesity Federation that played a crucial role in ensuring that this actually came to life. So I say thank you, and I will be back with you uh, sooner or later uh, for topical issues around these discussions, which I think would continue to happen. So I want to wish everybody uh, a lovely day. Enjoy the rest of the day and uh, have fun. So we are out in five, Four, three, two, one. So bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.